Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So we start this uh, afternoon session, and uh, we start we start with Dr. David Zetsky. Uh, we will talk to. Oh, sorry, uh, we will talk to us about. Uh, <laughs> Biomarkers for lupus, a critical point of view and their relevance to clinical practice. <laughs> Dr. David uh, is a professor of medicine and immunology at the Duke University Medical Center and chief of rheumatology at the Dunham VA Hospital. For over 30 years, uh, he has investigated the pathogenesis of systemic lupus erythematosus, focusing on the mechanisms of anti-DNA production in human and urine lupus. In addition, he has extensively characterized the immunological properties uh, of DNA, HNGB1, and other nuclear molecules, and the role of DNA structure in determining immunogenicity. Recent studies have focused on the role of microparticles as a source of DNA antigen. He has published over 300 articles and chapters and was the editor of the Arthritis and Rheumatism from 2000 to 2005. Uh, Dr. David, please. Thank you very much. Well, I'm very pleased and honored to be here and appreciate the invitation from the organizers to present this perspective. Uh, what I'm going to do is really focus on the serology of lupus, although there are many biomarkers which have been developed I think the most durable and the most informative remains serology, and although we've been studying the anti-DNA response for a very long time, I think it's critically important right now to re review this biomarker uh, for reasons that you've heard at this very exciting conference, is that as we go forward in therapy, an important issue is going to be people who have active lupus or serologically active lupus, and therefore I think we need some type of uh, test or tests to make that distinction. Now, as you've heard, there are many biomarkers in lupus that you all use commonly. Some of them are very simple and nonspecific, such as the blood count or proteinuria. Others are more specific, but I think as we go forward, what we really have to say is what kind of information do you want and what kind of information can these tests provide? Now, it's good to go back in history. Uh, my preference in this field is to use what I call mechanism-based biomarkers, and that is a test of one or another kind that really gives us some insight into disease, and I think then practically, clinically, you have more confidence and interest in using it because it does point to some mechanism. And these are a version of Cox postulates. They were formally uh, codified by an investigator in a named Witebski, whose name is not commonly used, but nevertheless, he was one of the first to point out that you can, in fact, develop the equivalent of Cox postulates for autoimmunity, and that is you need to demonstrate an autoantibody, you need to know what the antigen is for that autoantibody. Experimentally, it's good to show that you can produce antibodies against the same antigen in experimental animals and reproduce disease, not just serological abnormality and that the animals themselves demonstrate the same type of pathology as do the patients. Now, modifications of this include induction of disease by transfer of serum or transfer of cells, especially in the case of those that are cell-based. So ideally, uh, for a biomarker, you would like to have an antibody in it that could fulfill these postulates. Now, in reality, these postulates are often not met. Many instances, we cannot really clearly relate the serology or the marker to a specific disease or a specific manifestations, and there's uncertainty about the nature of the systems that you have um, you he that you measure. There's also very frequently discrepancies between serology and antibody testing uh, and pathogenesis, and difficulty in distinguishing, in fact, which antibodies are pathological, which is aberrantly produced, and which are pathogenic, that is, they actually cause disease. And as you know very well from lupus, many, dis many autoimmune diseases, certainly preeminently lupus, are serologically very heterogeneous. And then there are multiple different autoantibodies that are produced simultaneously, and that makes it very difficult to sort out the contribution of any one specificity. Now, this is a classification of autoantibodies that I use. Uh, that I think differs maybe from others in that it admits other possible roles of the, of the autoantibodies. 
Now, we usually think of autoantibodies as pathological, that is, it's produced during disease and has potential to cause disease manifestations. But for me, if it's just produced in disease, I would consider that pathological. A subset of pathological antibodies are pathogenic, and that is, it causes disease manifestation. And that doesn't specify by which mechanism uh, is involved, so it could include renal disease, it could include cytotoxicity, it could include immune complex formation. But those antibodies that cause disease are pathogenic. Now, in lupus, where nephritis is a key issue, we can subset and talk about nephritogenic antibodies, which are a type of pathogenic antibody, but their unique feature is their ability to cause kidney disease. Now, there is another type of autoantibody, many times the same exact specificity as those that cause nephritis, that lead to the induction of cytokines. They usually don't do it by themselves. They need their partner antigen. We do not have a good term for those antibodies. So they are pathogenic, and their specific capacity is cytokine production. But we, again, we don't have a simple single term. Now, there are autoantibodies that are likely beneficial. Rheumatoid factors, not necessarily in lupus, are likely beneficial. That's why they're produced so commonly during infections. Um, they can uh, have many different functions that are good. We measure them sometimes in disease, and sometimes we get confused as to why they are there. But nevertheless, there are certainly normally produced autoantibodies like rheumatoid factors. There is increasing evidence for autoantibodies that are, in fact, protective. I think this comes as a very big surprise. Um, but there are animal studies that suggest that antibodies to a nuclear molecule called HMGB1 actually are protective, and they can block responses such as sepsis, and it can block inflammatory disease. Antibodies to histones, similarly in animal models, are protective in shock models and thrombosis. Now, we usually categorize antibodies as bad or neutral, but in fact, there some may be good. And as a presentation some of you may have heard, there was, seems to be an association between the presence of anti-DNA and less cancer. Now, that could be a surprise or not, but that is a setting which the antibody itself may have some protective uh, properties. Now, the confounding feature in these diseases is that the appearance of anti-nuclear antibodies is unbelievably common in the general population. So about 15 to 25 percent of otherwise normal individuals, or seemingly normal, are ANA positive at good titers uh, by many different assays. So the question is, what, what are these, and how do I classify them? knowing they appear in otherwise normal individuals. Now, talking about biomarkers, I think it's very useful to say there are different types of biomarkers and which are you interested in. So there are so-called antecedent biomarkers, which define a risk for disease. There are screening biomarkers, which look for subclinical disease in people who do not yet overtly have signs and symptoms. There are diagnostic biomarkers, which allow you to make the diagnosis of heart disease in people with signs and symptoms. There are staging biomarkers, which give you a measure of disease severity or disease activity. And there are prognostic biomarkers, which allow you to predict future disease course or response to therapy, or they could be useful in monitoring therapy. Now, some biomarkers or some tests are useful in all contexts. Some are not. And so I think it's very important as one goes out to try to develop biomarkers or refine biomarkers in lupus to say which, which of these do you want, and correspondingly in a clinical, why are you doing the test? Is it to diagnose disease? Is it to stage it? Or is it in somebody with a family history to say, could there be a likelihood? Now, another facet of this is there are some biomarkers that we now, because of experience and, and research, are likely to be done repetitively. We keep on doing it. Anti-DNA is one. We keep doing it because we believe it's going to give information. On the other hand, there are some antibodies we'll only do once in the history of a patient. SM, RNP, Rho, La, even an ANA. We'll never do again because we got the information we thought we needed. And in some of the early trials, for example, in Binlista, there was a big surprise. There was a significant number of people in those trials that were ANA negative at the time they were entered into the study. And the question was, was there an assay issue? Did they really have lupus? Or is this really a feature of lupus we haven't recognized before? And that is autoantibodies go away, and these people no longer have all the overt immunologic disturbances that lead to autoantibodies. They had bona fide lupus, 
It's just at a different stage of disease. On the other hand, when you keep assaying autoantibodies, then you have a better perspective of what happens over time. Now, in lupus is now familiar. Uh, these are some of just the few of the many tens of different antigens that are found, but these turn out to be probably the ones that you need to know about. DNA and histones, SM and RMP, SM and RMP are so-called SNRPs or small nipple nuclear proteins comprised of proteins and nucleic acid. Rho and La are also RNA protein complexes. Ribosomal P, originally identified as a molecule that binds ribosome, or as you probably heard, in one of the presentations has cross-reactivity with a neuronal surface protein. So the thinking of this as coming from uh, protein synthesis machinery may not be fully correct. And the exception in terms of protein are phospholipid. So what are the features of these antigens? Well, in general, they're highly, highly conserved. They subserve very important cell functions, DNA synthesis, uh, transcription, translation. Very importantly, from my thinking, they exist as complexes in cells. Now, as immunologists, we very frequently take structures apart to facilitate assays. I think this really leads to a misunderstanding of what goes on in disease, because these molecules do not exist as biochemically discrete material. They exist as complexes. And if you really want to understand the immune response, what you have to understand is the complex, not the isolated molecule. You can assay isolated molecules, but I don't think you get as much information. During uh, normal cell function or cell death, these are commonly cleaved or rearranged, particularly during the process of apoptosis. A number of investigators, Anthony Rosen in particular, has identified this aspect as an important feature. They are commonly released outside of the cell, although we think of them as intracellular molecules. Many of them do have extracellular life. And very important, many of these molecules are intrinsically immunologically active, and they can alone or in complexes stimulate immune activity. Now, the ones we focus on are DNA and RNA, and they can stimulate a variety of different so-called sensors in the innate immune system. These are so-called toll-like receptors, but they're also toll-like receptors. Uh, DNA stimulates toll 9, RNA stimulates toll 3 and 7, depending on whether it's single or double strand, but there are a whole host of sensors for nucleic acid. You can ask why are they there. It's most likely to respond to DNA or RNA from viruses that are on the inside of the cell. Now, these sensors are inside the cell, and therefore, for extracellular molecules to stimulate them, they have to get inside the cell, and one of the molecules that will get them in are antibodies. So immune complexes in lupus are very important to drive these responses of the nucleic acids, and so they act as carriers or chaperone to get nucleic acids that are outside the cell back inside the cell, and this accounts for a unique feature of nucleic acids, and they can be targets of autoantibodies, but they themselves can drive autoantibody production, and they are so-called autoadjuvants. So normally when they're inside the cells, they're protected from this uh, activity. Once they get outside the cell, they can display it, but what's required is the antibody. So we know a number of clinical associations of, of anti-DNA. Some of them make sense, uh, such as anti-DNA and nephritis for your immune complexes. Some uh, probably less obscure or more obscure, such as Rho and neonatal lupus. It may be a cross-reactivity or a unique expression of Rho during cardiac development. Antibodies to P and cerebritis, always a surprise because uh, ribosomal P is an all cell, but as again, there's evidence there's cross-reactivity. And antiphospholipid and related antibodies such as lupus anticoagulants and thrombosis. Now of the group, the ones that we most commonly assay for are anti-DNA looking for nephritis, and antiphospholipids and thrombosis. Now, one of the features of anti-nuclear antibodies is this enormous heterogeneity. And the heterogeneity varies in terms of expression of individual specificities in patients, frequently in terms of racial or ethnic groups. In the United States, anti-SM and anti-RNP are much more common in African Americans than they are of people of European descent for unknown reasons. And it becomes a characteristic specificity. Another feature of heterogeneity is what these antibodies look like in terms of levels over time. Uh, and there are some, as we'll see, that vary enormously and some that don't change. 
And this affects their assessment of their utility, first of all, a role in pathogenesis, the utility of biomarkers of certain kinds. So again, anti-SM and RMP, we don't routinely assay beyond once or twice uh, because we've decided it doesn't change much. So the antibodies that uh, can now be distinguished are antibodies to RNA binding proteins, SM, RNP, SM, RNP, Rho, and La, and anti-DNA really define two types of responses. It likely reflects the B cells that produce them and to the extent to which a, these antibodies come from so-called long-lived plasma cells. This is important clinically because long-lived plasma cells are very difficult to get rid of. Other B cell populations we can get rid of, particularly by rituximab. Now this is a slide that dates back about 30 years, one of the first things I ever did in my lab, um, was to measure over time the expression of SM and RNP in comparison to DNA, anti-DNA. The technology is old, this is uh, hemagglutinin titers on one hand, but what you can see is that anti-DNA, which is in the circle, is going up and down, uh, strikingly, with disease activity and in response to therapy, and it goes from high levels in the hundreds by the assay then used down to essentially undetectable. That is a remarkable response. It is very unusual to see antibody vary that much under any situation. So this is pointed to a unique feature of anti-DNA, which is why we measure it, and that is it changes over time. It gets higher with disease activity and it comes down with therapy. On the other hand, if you look at anti-SM, nothing happens. And these are people who at that point who can get treated with cytoxan, high dose steroids. So this is a fundamentally different type of response. This is why we do anti-DNA. This is why we don't do SMRNP over time. Now anti-DNA, although we, we like DNA because it's a, it's a purified molecule, really is a part of a family. And I will say you get very similar information, information if you assay for any family member. So there's antibodies to DNA, either single or double standard. There's antibodies to histones. DNA intimately associates with histones in the nucleus to forward the so-called nucleosome. Sometimes you can assemble this in vitro, and that's called the DNA histone complex. It may not have all the features of a nucleosome, the nucleosome itself, and you can measure chromatin, which is the form of DNA in the cell. That's part of the family. We like to measure DNA because it's pure, but you would get similar information for any of these. Now, as a biomarker, it's, I'll say it's our best. Highly associated with lupus in all the contexts we talked about. Assay is a big issue because different assays pick up different anti-DNA, and depending on the, car, on the manifestation, there's an excellent correlation in many, but not all, patients and the highest association is with nephritis. Now, there are many types of anti-DNA assays that are available. This is a historic list. Uh, it goes from immunodiffusion, which is sort of the, the most venerable of all assays, to complement fixation. Far binding uh, is a radiotype immunoassay in which uh, sera is mixed with radioactive DNA and then precipitated in high salt and ammonium sulfate. Therefore, the antibody you detect has to be resistant to high salt. And so it is a measure, a high affinity antibody, still done, and many people think it's the best. Filter binding, not done much anymore. A radio binding assay, crithidia, an immunofluorescent assay. ELISA assays in multiplex. ELISA is a solid phase, and the multiplex. So there are many differences of these assays. One is the form of DNA. Uh, you can do single and double strand and, and certainly some of these formats. The origin of the DNA, most science people do not ask the question, where's the DNA from, but it actually matters. So different DNAs, different sources uh, from bacterial or mammalian species will actually give you big differences in the level. We don't usually ask that question, and we should. The mobility of DNA, that is whether it's solid phase attached to a disease or in solution phase, how big the piece of DNA, whether it's in a solid or a solution phase, and then the other is the avidity of antibody detected. Now, there are people in this field who believe that high avidity antibodies are the most meaningful and the most informative. I, I am not one of them. Uh, so I do not feel the far assay really should become the gold standard, which is a high avidity assay. Why do I feel that? Because we don't really know the form of the DNA that's immunologically much meaningful. And the other, these antibody responses originate in people with very aberrant immune systems, 
and driving to a high affinity response may not take place. And so if we only looked at high affinity antibodies, which may be useful diagnostically, we may be missing many responses. Okay. A lot of discussion of single versus double-stranded DNA practically. I, would, I don't worry about this. Why don't I worry about it? Because most antibodies react to single and double-stranded DNA. It's only the minority of antibodies that are highly specific for double. Number of reasons, one of which is it's very difficult to make double-stranded DNA without single-stranded regions. It's very difficult to make single-stranded DNA without double-stranded DNA. And the other thing is DNA, depending on its form, can undergo conformational rearrangements and expose single-stranded regions. Assays with single-stranded DNA are technically much more easy and they're much more sensitive. So if I was in the situation of assessing disease activity, I'd rather do it with single-stranded DNA than double because I can pick up a huge amount of sensitivity. Not commonly done, and the reason is, again, because people think diagnostically double-strand is more specific. Each assay for anti-DNA has its own issues. A very important point, the same sera from the same person can behave very differently depending on the assay. Uh, this again becomes important now as you select patients for new therapies where serological activity is a criteria. So you have to know your assay and you have to know, again, whether this is a consistent finding the person is serologically negative or is that negatively really reflective of the assay used and it may be worthwhile trying more than one assay. All the assays show some correlation with disease activity, they're all good. Uh, and I don't know, again, that one's better than the next. Now, what is unclear here is the relationship between the antibodies they detected and either pathogenicity or nephritogenicity. That we don't know, because that's not what the assays were geared for. They were either diagnosis or staging. The relationship of high avidity antibodies to pathogenicity is just not known, and I think there are a number of reasons. And again, one of the confounding features is the presence of other autoantibodies at the same time in a patient. So anti-DNA causes disease by lots of mechanisms. The classic is circulating immune complexes. Routinely, these circulating complexes are not measured. It's technically difficult. We're working on other approaches, but not done yet. Immune complexes may form in the kidney by so-called immune complex um, for insight to immune complex formation in which case measurement of circulating immune complexes wouldn't be informative. Some anti-DNAs directly bind to either renal or non-renal antigens, and that that's really the relevant specificity. There are data that DNA can get in, anti-DNA can get inside the cell, and then there's also data, which I think is now very important, is that anti-DNA like antibodies to RNA binding proteins can form complexes that stimulate and an ability to measure those complexes would be very important because those complexes lead to interferon production. This is a very important paper. And really what it said is to really understand the serology of lupus, you have to understand what's happening with the partner antigen. This was Lars Runblan who just took supernatants of dead cells uh, and mixed it with IgG and got a very potent stimulation of interferon. Either component alone was inactive. So this is, again, data from uh, Professor Ronbaum. It says if you take serum, there can be activity. It stimulates interferon production. If you just looked at the antibody itself, no activity. If you looked at normal Ig with supernatants, you've got to mix them together. So if you really wanted to understand what's going on, what you would need is an assay for the combination. That assay is not yet available, but would be very important. The alternative is to look, uh, and these are studies a number of individuals have done, you know, by gene array, which can now be reduced uh, to simpler assays in terms of uh, uh, assay of specific products, that's into, uh, genes that interfere on induce. This is a very popular assay format that not yet entered the clinic. And what you can see here is there are a variety of signatures. The one I will pay attention to for the purpose of this lecture is the interferon signature, and what that seems to require, again, is an immune complex of DNA and anti-DNA, or an immune complex of an antibody to an, an RNA binding protein, such as SM, RNP, Rho, and La. But to get the stimulation, you need both partners, 
we don't assay both partners. We just assay the antibody. To really understood what was going on, to drive interferon, you would need an assay of immune complexes. Now, there is another issue here, and that is what is the significance of a positive ANA itself in the population? And this has been a source of great interest or a great confusion, depending on your perspective. And that is in very good studies using reliable assays, up to 25% of otherwise healthy individuals are ANA positive. So as a screening test for antecedent, you know, looking as an antecedent marker or a screening marker, you're running into big problems because so many people in the population have it. Also, it becomes a very big problem in terms of the individual patient who may come in with what I'll call nonspecific signs and symptoms, whether it's fatigue or uh, you know, fibromyalgia-like syndromes, fevers. The chance of anybody being ANA positive is almost one in four. So the question is, when you have people who are symptomatic and you use this test, what does all that mean? We don't know what the ANAs are like in normal individuals, and this has been really an issue. They're very frequently there. We don't have a good test. Now, the fallback test is really to then assay a specific autoantibody using another type of technology. So to assay the common antibodies such as DNA, histones, SM, RNP, Rho, and La. That's the fallback position. Now, the question is, are, if we do that, are we somehow losing information that would be important? So this just illustrates sort of the, the problem in terms of serological testing or in the context of biomarker, and that is the high frequency of positivity in the general population. And this is, again, a collaborative study by a number of investigators using, again, good technology and what's illustrated here is the very high frequency of, of ANA positivity in the general population and a striking difference between males and females. So why do females have more ANAs? It would be speculative, you know, whether this is just a reflection of their immune system or some type of immune stimulation that females are more responsive to than males, again, would be unknown. But since autoimmune disease occurs so much more commonly in females than males, the chance of anyone coming in is so high. Now, with respect to age, this occurs slightly later than sort of the peak of lupus. This is not a phenomenon of older individuals. And I think people long thought that the older people get, the more likely they are to have an anti-nuclear antibody, and that is not necessarily true. It's younger people you know, people in their 40s. Again, an, a, a, you know, a patient population or a demographic where consultation with a rheumatologist or immunologist is not unlikely to evaluate signs and symptoms. So in the peak years of lupus, again, just slightly delayed, then there is this high peak of ANA positivity. And again, origin would be speculative, but it confounds our workup especially if our fallback assays for specific autoantibodies are not positive. And the question is, what do you do? Now, the other issue about this, again, studies now, I think, are really a seminal study um, from Arbuckle, John Harley, Judith James, and their collaborators of Oklahoma, was to ask, when do people become serological positive? They did this in a, a military uh, 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 serum bank where serum were collected every year. Then they were able to go back and, uh, when people diagnosed lupus, ask when they became serologically positive. And the answer is years before disease, years before. Um, Anti-Rho, interestingly enough, not, you know, a diagnostic specificity of lupus was positive quite early on, uh, as was antiphospholipid antibodies. The other antibodies become more frequent as you get uh, towards the diagnosis. What this means is that even if you uh, do uh, additional serologically testing of people who are ANA positive. You may be picking up meaningful antibodies years before their diagnosis, and it's hard to tell patients what that means. So in conclusion, patients with lupus, very wide variety of antibodies. Importance mechanistically is the antigens to which they're directed have immunological activity. Our mainstay assay in this day and age remains anti-DNA. However, this assay is not yet standardized. Different assays 
give different uh, information, practically, clinically, which is important in selection of patients, and sometimes in follow-up. And the other is just to understand that anti-nuclear antibodies arise in people with immune disturbance, and we do not fully know the rules for immune recognition in people with aberrant immune systems, and that I think personally we should get away from the idea it's high affinity or high avidity antibodies that become most uh, meaningful. So thank you for your attention. We have time for questions. Thank you, Dr. Bzetsky. Uh, we have time, I think, for two short questions. First here in the middle. Uh, on the Belista trial, uh, you could go in if you were zero positive a year before and you can prove this to the, to the monitor. But when, when they break it down to those who are actually active versus those who are not active, that they find out that serological difference. Now the question is, what, does, what are the influence for long-lived plasma cells to secrete or not secrete the antinuclear antibody? I mean, this is an important question, sort of basic immune. Long-lived plasma cells are, are just key for normal immunology because you need to have durable immune responses. And certain responses are, I'm going to say, unbelievably long-lived after a vaccination, for example. It appears that certain antibodies have that capacity to generate, and that may reflect the antigen that drives them or something else. Anti-DNA in many individuals don't make it to the long-lived plasma cell stage. That's why they go away. Uh, now, if you say, what is it about, you know, one response versus another that allows the generation of long-lived plasma cells, that's not known. And in this regard, the mice may behave differently than the humans. But it's a very important issue, uh, again, since we know that responses like SM, RMP, Rho, and La can uh, lead to interferon production if their antigen is present. So I think what you would suggest is those people that still are serologically active, even if they're not anti-DNA positive, have some type of immune reactivity reflective of the antibodies to the RNA binding protein that then becomes amenable to therapy. So I think one of the take-home messages is anti-DNA and anti-RBPs are different. They're coming out of different populations and you have to analyze them separately. Again, my preference is to have very broad assays if I'm going to try to look at serological activity once I know the person has disease. So I would rather use an antibody to DNA, it could be single, double strand, and at least a low affinity format to make that distinction. I have concerns about using a far type assay there because I think you miss responses. Now, I can't address more the technology of using SM and RNP because that's increasingly a LISA type and multiplex assay. And what's unclear is are we missing any specificities that way? Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Zatsky. So we proceed.